God created man to be a resting place. So with Adam, he walked in the cool of the day. Noah built an ark because God strove with man till Abraham was picked. The father had a plan. Why pick a people? Why choose a nation? Simple. The savior needs a lineage, a family, a location. So God freed his nation from Pharaoh's oppression, not to build their own Egypt. He delivered them for worship. God asked for a tent somewhere he could rest. Moses built the altar with a radiant face. But God didn't want sacrifice for the sake of appeasement. He longed for intimacy, for closeness, for agreement. So when David got the ark, he didn't lock it away. He erected a new tent and worshiped night and day. Finally, a place where God's presence could rest and God's glory stayed while praise was expressed. But sin was a problem. His presence disregarded. As the praise tent fell down, God's glory departed. Till Jesus brought the seeds of the garden to the earth. That's why the angels cried glory the night of his birth. The cross tore the veil, separation dispelled. His spirit now could live inside of us to dwell. A nation of priests, the kingdom of hosts, the temple of God went global and remote. If worship's unceasing right now around the throne, Jesus prayed here on earth like in heaven as it's shown. Gather even more as the day's drawing close. Rebuild David's tent from the islands to the coast. Every home and altar, every church, a house of prayer, a welcome party for Jesus when we meet him in the air. A thousand year reign to get the earth ready for the garden city, the new Jerusalem will descend down from heaven. No tears, pain, or darkness. The last will see night, for his glory will dwell. The lamb is its light. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. At last, a resting place, a garden forever. Amen. Amen. Not going to lie, the 11 a.m. gave me a really terrible golf clap, and I almost didn't do the poem for the second service because of that. But I love the 11. <laughs> I'm Pastor Caleb. Uh, I'm here, and uh, one of the worship pastors here. want to say hello to those in Portage and online. And uh, this poem is what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're talking about the resting place for God. The, the, the sermon title is Every Home and Altar, and we're continuing on our Acts series. So go ahead and turn to Acts 15. But we're starting, before we even read the scripture, we're, we're starting with uh, the question that I hope you've been asking and that we should be asking, which is, what is God doing on the earth today? We're so focused on what is happening in the kingdom of darkness, but we serve a God who is always initiating. God is not a reactive God. He's not, the enemy doesn't do something. He's like, oh my gosh, I got to figure out a plan. He's the one who's in control. He's always moving. And today we're going to look at one of the great prophetic promises for this time right now. The scripture that's talking about this day and age to see what God is doing on the earth. And so I hope you are ready to receive that. I hope you've been asking the question. We're going to kind of look at this scripture together. We're going to read a lot of Bible. Is that okay with you guys this morning? Hope so. D promise me that you're not going to let your mind wander. You're not going to think about the Richland Meat Market brats that you're going to eat after the 11 a.m. service. You're going to focus. <laughs> Acts 15, starting in verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversions of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to come to the brethren. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported of the things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it's necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter. 
And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between them purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked among the Gentiles. And after that, after they had become silent, James answered, saying, men, brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God has first visited the Gentiles to take them out, uh, take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it's written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all of these things. Amen. I love this scripture because it's the messy church in the middle of revival. We sometimes romanticize revival in this idea of everybody's just in perfect harmony. There's no issues and problems. But of course, the, the book of Acts is showing the church in Jerusalem that has a major problem in the sense of they are half Pharisees or people that have followed the traditions of the Mosaic law, you know, to the T. And now you have revival hitting among the, the, the Romans and the Greeks and those from all over the place. And, and so you got, you know, essentially, you, you know, you have these people from Jerusalem and then you have a bunch of outsiders who don't know the traditions and customs. And this, this, this uh, empire, it was a wicked time. I mean, these people could have been just months ago been involved in, in, in orgies and sacrificing to idols and all types of unbelievably horrific things. And all of a sudden, they're all slammed in one church together. And you have a mess where you just have different people and socioeconomical differences, racism, all of these things. And so you see this doctrine kind of pops up in the midst of this revival that says, hey, you know, you have to be circumcised to be saved. And it really tickles the ears of the Pharisees because they are all circumcised. You know, notice everybody who's already had the circumcision is on board. Uh, they, they have already received, they've already received the circumcision and they've also been following the laws. And so it's like, yeah, hey, we've had to sacrifice so much. These guys should, should have to sacrifice too, um, you know, which is a tough evangelistic sell. It's hard to be like, hey, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You're saved by grace through faith, but there's this one thing you got to do. You're going to have to unbutton your pants for me. Like, it, it's, a, it's a tough sell. <laughs> but you understand that to them, it was a major marking of who they were. And this is a big ordeal of this Gentile and Jew church coming together. And so I love the heart of the apostles, though. They don't come in and they don't, like, smack them right over the head with doctrine right away. They, they use stories. Listen. This is, you know, this is Bob, Bob, the electrician, and his whole family got saved. You know, his 10 year old girl couldn't walk and now she's walking and now he's saving everybody at his at his shop. And, and they start telling the stories of God moving among the Gentiles. So they're sharing these testimonies. And then I love the heart of James. As everybody's sharing testimony, James stands up. And he's my guy because he's like, let's take a second to get some prophetic understanding of what's happening. He's asking that question, God, what are you doing in the earth today? Because we're talking really about kind of a specific rule. But James, he says, listen, let's, what, is, what is God doing as a whole? And he brings this beautiful passage from Amos 9-11 where God says, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. I will restore its ruins and, and, and in this, he says, the Gentiles are going to seek the Lord. And, and what, what James is saying here is, listen, this isn't about circumcision or uncircumcision. This is about God receiving the worship that's due his name. And this is what God's doing. He's bringing in the Gentiles at this time. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a powerful uh, uh, statement that James is making and uh, you know, I think it's, it's missed a lot of times because we are 
so used to temple language. And of course, the temple's in the New Testament. Jesus says, I'm the temple. And, uh, and, and then we know that from 1 Corinthians that our bodies are personally the temple of the Holy Spirit because Jesus tore the veil. But here we have uh, 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 not the temple, but the stage before the temple called David's tabernacle highlighted with this prophetic promise from Yahweh saying, I'm going to, before Jesus comes back, I'm going to do this brand new thing. And so to understand it, we have to understand God's desire for a resting place and for a dwelling place. And so when we say temple and we say tent, what's the difference here? And so I just have four words. I hope this kind of sticks with us, but individual temple, that's you, corporate tent. You yourself, individually, temple of the Holy Spirit. Corporately, we are a tent. We are the tabernacle of God. And, and so to obviously understand what is David's tabernacle, why is it important, what does it mean that God's going to rebuild it, we have to go back kind of to the origins of the temple and, and, and tabernacle. And so the, we go all the way back to Exodus when God frees his people for worship we see in Exodus 19, 5 through 6, God pauses. He's such a good father. He just, he fathers Israel so well. He, he brings them out. He saves them from Egypt. And then what is, what's the first thing? You know, when a nation is born, when a person is born, what happens? The father and mother name them, right? They give them definition and identity through a name. Well, that's exactly what the father does. He brings them across the Dead Sea, and then he names them and gives them identity in Exodus 19, 5. Now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now, this is a big point. Pay attention. This is a big point that a lot of people miss because they think the priesthood, New Testament reality, we're all priests. Old Testament, there's only a couple priests. But we see the vulnerability, the, the, the heart of God displayed, where he says, my desire, my heart, as your father, my heart is that you are a nation of priests, that everyone be a priest. Well, well what is a priest? Maybe when you hear the word priest, you, you, know, you might think of confession or a benediction or, or some, some person who serves you in some sense. Well, let's look at what Exodus 28 and 29 say, go ahead and put that, that slide up there. God, when he defines the priesthood six times, and six is the number of man, God uses it to define things like everything was made in six days. Six times God says this phrase that he or they may minister to me as priests. What is the primary calling of a priest? It's to minister to God. What does that mean, minister to God? You might be like, I don't, you know, I'm not in ministry. I don't know what that means. It just means to, to give him glory and honor, and he takes delight in that. He really loves you a ton. You make a lot of mistakes, and you're really messed up. You know, that's the bad news. But God, he, he still sees, and he loves, and he delights in you. And when you turn your face toward his face, Oh, it wrecks his heart. It moves his heart. It is what he is wanting and what he's looking for, a people that minister to him. But what did, how did Israel receive this revelation of a God who wants everyone to draw near? Well, they saw him moving on the mountain and they built a golden calf and they said, we'd rather have one of these kind of Egyptian style gods. And we, we, we want to keep God at a distance, we love the protection and atonement part. That stuff's awesome. We get our sins forgiven. We don't burn in hell. And you do that crazy open the sea thing and crush enemies. We love that. But, but your presence and your personhood, that, that scares me. I, I don't want that. I want somebody to do that for me. And so for 400 years, Israel had a tent in the middle of their camp 
And in this, the, the Ark of the Covenant, it's where God's presence rests, his kabod, the weight of who he is between the cherubim, it rests and dwelt to be visited once a year by the high priest on the Day of Atonement. God was amongst the people, but he was isolated from the people. And for 400 years, we don't see anybody complain or question that. Everyone seems to be cool with it. Then one day pressure comes. And the Philistines are rising up against Israel. Eli's the, the prophet slash judge. And his sons are evil. They've, they've been sleeping with temple prostitutes. They've been desecrating me. And so all of a sudden this, this rises up and they've perverted the priesthood. And they say, oh, I know what to do. We grab the Ark of the Covenant. We just, you know, trot it out there. And God will just magically defeat the enemies. We'll put it back and go back to our lifestyle. God won't be handled, restrained, or controlled, but he will be hosted by people who want him. They didn't want him. And so they brought the presence of God out, and the entire army was routed. Hophni and Phinehas dead, Eli dead, and the presence of God was captured. That's what the enemy's doing. Well, what was God doing in the earth? God, at the same time the ark was being captured, he got this little boy on the back hills of Bethlehem. And he didn't have proximity to the Ark of the Covenant, but he had his own holy of holies called the back hills of Bethlehem where he worshiped and he prayed. And the delight and glory of God dwelt and rested on him. And Samuel anointed him. And David went on a 26-year journey to become king. And at the end of the journey... He unites the kingdoms, becomes king. It's time to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. It's time to restore the presence back to Moses' tent. He goes and gets the Ark, and he has a kingly robe on, and, and, and uh, the, the person who's carrying it in a car, Uzzah, got comfortable with the presence, reached out and touched the Ark. But God will not be handled, restrained, or controlled he will be hosted by people who want him. He tried to handle God and Uzzah died. David went away angry, offended. What the heck? I just came to be king to bring your presence back. And this is how you treat me. He's angry. He goes back to Jerusalem. And this guy named Obed-Edom arises and changes history forever. Obed-Edom was half Levite, half Philistine, And this guy, after seeing the death and the turmoil that's been happening for 26 years on the Ark of the Covenant, he does something that few would ever dare to do. He said, you know, yeah, you know that object that's been killing people nonstop? Yeah, go ahead and put that in my living room. <laughs> I don't know about you, like, you know, if there was like a thing where it's like all Samsung TVs are exploding and killing everybody when you turn them on, like I wouldn't be like, man, let's get a Samsung and just put it in our living room and just, this is great, you know, like I, I'm thinking if I have to take the ark, then I'm putting it all the way on the corner of my lot and building a little shed and then a wall and then another wall and we're never going to look and never going to think, never going to do anything. We're just going to pretend it's not over there and one day hopefully it disappears. But Obed-Edom understood something about the God who chose a nation of priests. And he brought the presence of God to the center of the home. He didn't have a sacrificial system. He wasn't slaughtering bulls and goats. He wasn't offering incense. He didn't have a table of showbread. He just had the presence. And God just simply rested. And David's kind of waiting. He's like, you know, he's waiting for the news story to break. Like, newsflash, Obed-Edom and his family, they all die, Raiders of the Lost Ark style, where they all just like are eviscerated by like lasers coming out of the ark. He's waiting for the story. But then what comes back is, have you heard the news? Obed-Edom got promoted at his job. His wife won a beauty contest. The kids are all like making varsity basketball. And God is blessing everything. And David gets provoked. And David goes to get the ark again. And remember last time he wore the kingly garment? David was from Judah. That's the lineage where the Israel kings were from. Well, this time he took off the kingly garment. You know what he put on? An ephod. Who wore the ephod? The priests. The priests were the Levites. 
If you were from Judah, you couldn't be a priest. Well, here we go. David understood the heart of a father that said he wanted a kingdom of priests and a priest is somebody who ministers before the Lord. He takes off the kingly robe. He puts on the ephod. Instead of walking like a dignitary, he dances like a fool. And that's the part of the story that most people latch onto. And it's obviously insanely powerful. You know, it's been used by people who like, you know, have disrupted church services for thousands of years, you know, like David danced in his underwear. I can take my shirt off. Like, no, no, that's, that's not what happened. Uh, David in this moment is taking the ark and it's going back to the tabernacle of Moses. This is so exciting. They get to Gibeon where it's time to take a left turn and bring the ark back. And David shocks everybody. When he's supposed to take a left, he takes a right. And he makes a beeline for the city of David and goes right to the top of Mount Zion. And he's built not a tabernacle with three compartments in it, but a tent with one big open space. And he brings the presence of God in at the center. And then he gets 4,000 Levite singers and 288 Levite musicians. And they begin to play and worship. I like to think like, because this, this was such a revolutionary moment. I was like, what would it have been like to have been like the first worship leader in that tabernacle? You know, like, you're like, David, are you sure we can do this? Like, I didn't read any scriptures about this. Are you sure? Because it's kind of the ark. Like, you're just kind of like going to lead worship. And you talk about pressure, worship. Like, sometimes you're like, man, what, what happens if I don't open with the right song? Like, congregation might be mad at me. It's like, man, what if I open with the wrong song and God kills me? <laughs> he just, in that moment, the presence and power of God, and instead of killing everybody, instead of God being angry, instead of God rejecting, the opposite happens. Where God dwells amongst man and his presence fills the tent and his glory fills the tent and revival spills out into Israel. Israel went from silence to song in a year. There was no corporate worship services. There were no songs that were written for the Bible. And now you have an explosion of worship songs and prayer songs. People are having prophetic visions of Jesus and the end times. And, and homes have gone from silence to being filled with singing and music and prayer. And the landscape has completely shifted. God now is breaking out of the compartment and he's filling his, his people. We sang it earlier Psalm 22, he inhabits, God lives in, he dwells, he rests, he puts his feet up, so to speak, in the praises of his people. And this tabernacle of David changed everything in history forever. Now we remember that James said, in the last days, I, meaning God, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. He didn't say, I'm going to rebuild that temple. Because what? The temple's the individual, right? Unless you're there, there's no, no engaging with it. But a tabernacle, a tent is global. We can't build a billion dollar temple, right? But we can buy a $50 tent from Walmart, right? Like we can go camping anywhere. That's the point of camping. That's why we all do it. You know, that, that's what we love in Michigan, too. I mean, it's like everyone's like, let's live like homeless people all summer. And everyone loves it. It's like, it's amazing. Like, I'm not a big camper, uh, as you probably can't tell. But uh, I have a, a biblical courtship with nature. We will spend the day together. But then at the evening, we say goodnight. I go into my bed. Nature has her bed. And it's, it works out great. But when you're, what's the thing with a tent? It's now, it's global, it's everywhere, and it spills out. The people could hear the worship and praise happening all over Jerusalem. The trade routes that went right by Jerusalem, they're walking by for years, it's been silent, and all of a sudden, they hear shouting and screaming and dancing. You're like, what in the heck is going on in Jerusalem with this tent? It's exploding all over the earth. And God said he's gonna rebuild that. So let's ask the question, why a tent? Why a tent? The first is the spiritual legacy. 
David changed history because he built the tabernacle of David. Did you know that the seven times that Israel came back to God, the seven revivals of Israel, every single time they reinstituted the Davidic form of worship. So that worship expression didn't just live on in David's day, but it was Solomon and Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah and Ezra and Nehemiah. All of these leaders, every time they move back to God, you know what they do? They take worship and prayer and they put it back at the center. The legacy from that. I want to look at Obed-Edom because Obed-Edom's kind of the man. Here's a guy who couldn't be in the priesthood because he's half Philistine, which the Israelites looked down on worse than if he was just a full Philistine. They would look like, him a, like a traitor. They would call him uh, uh, racist terms like half-breed and say these horrible things. And, and here's a guy who seemingly is not qualified to host the presence of God. And then let's, he brings it in and hosts his presence. But what's beautiful is this is not where Obed-Edom's story ends. It says later that he became a gatekeeper, a doorkeeper in the house of his God. Before Obed-Edom was probably living for himself, his house, his family, it was just about what he could pass on to his kids financially, their education, their success. And the narcissism of his world got interrupted by three months in the presence of God. And he got consumed with something that was bigger than himself. Well, how did that impact his, his, his family? Well, let's see. In 1 Chronicles 26, 1 through 4. As for the divisions of the gatekeepers, this is naming the gatekeepers. And then it goes, says, Obed, Edoms, and then his eight sons, for they were men of great ability. This is so incredible to me. One guy chooses three months of saying yes to the presence of God. Every one of his sons, not only are not lost, they're like, we can't wait to be in the house. We just want to serve the house of God. All eight of them serving the Lord, loving the Lord, worshipers of the Lord, generational blessing on the house of Obed-Edom because his yes to say yes to the presence of God. I think of Asaph. This one makes me particularly excited. Asaph was one of the three worship leaders that were the chief worship leaders in David's tabernacle, he wrote 12 Psalms. He was the one David would give Psalms to. You, you know, you look in the header and sometimes, you know, David would write the Psalm and then he would give it to Asaph for, to have them lead in the house. And he lived in the most comfortable uh, uh, war-free time in Israel's history because of that time. And yet we see the impact of his own worship leading generations later. I want to read a quick story to kind of show us that in uh, in 2 Chronicles 20, 15 through 22. There's this mystery prophet who rises up. It's a time where Israel's under siege. They might all die. They might, have to, they, they might uh, be in exile. And everyone doesn't know what to do. Should we fortify our defenses? Should we have everybody fight? What's our military strategy? And this mystery prophet arises. And he said, listen, all of you Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem... And you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord today, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the accent, the ascent, excuse me, ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Now let's look in verse 22. Now when they began to sing in praise, this is the worshipers who've gone before the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. They put the worshipers in front of the army, and they worshiped. What a stupid strategy. Remember, you're supposed to get the Ark of the Covenant and float it out there like a trinket. But God will not be handled 
restrained or controlled, but he will be hosted by people who want him. They hosted his presence. They worshiped and gave him glory and honor, and the Lord did the fighting. Well, who was this mystery prophet? Who would have such an insanely radical idea to worship? Well, let's look two verses before. I'm glad you asked. Great question. Second Chronicles 2014. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Matanah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph. Ho, 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 ho. Asaph. Just a worship leader, right? Showing up, singing in the house of God, learning to lead worship. His kids every day, they hear their daddy singing worship songs. And he's in the scriptures. What are you doing, daddy? I'm I'm writing a song to sing in the house of God. And he thinks his worship is just impacting that moment. But somewhere along the line, his son gets into his DNA. Home isn't about me. It's about hosting God's presence. And my daddy knows that when there's trial and tribulation, we rise up and we worship. That's what we do in this family. And that got passed down to his son. And that got passed down to his son. And that got passed down to his son. And that son lived in a time that Asaph didn't even live in. Asaph didn't even live in a time where there was these massive wars. But his great, great grandson under a time of pressure He had DNA in his system, a legacy of worship and prayer at the center of the home. And he says, King Jehoshaphat, fear not. If we worship, then God will do the fighting for us. And the king's heart that was cowardly and scared got bold and got courage and filled with hope. And they took this miraculous, ridiculous idea and they put it on the forefront. And God delivered Israel because of one man's worship hundreds of years earlier. Listen, I love these things that I'm going to say, so I'm not, I'm not trying to trash these things individually. I have these myself, but your, your 401ks, your Roth funds, the education that you buy for your kids will help them and will help the next generation. But the legacy of worship and prayer in your home will live on for generations. If your kids see you praying when you start getting stressed out about finances or when there's a family difficulty, they know what we do. We get together as a family and we worship and we pray. And even though we don't feel it, we get up on Sunday mornings and we go into the house of God and we worship together whether we feel like it or not. You are building a legacy And you are starting to rebuild David's tent. This idea of a God who will not be handled, restrained, or controlled, but he will be hosted by simply people who want him. So why a tent? First, it's generational. Next is it's global. Everyone can participate. The tent of God is global. Aren't you glad that God can't just be found in a temple in Jerusalem? but it's global. That's what the whole point of this passage is. James is getting excited because he's like, don't you see you guys are arguing about circumcision, but 2000 years from now, there's a church called Radiant Church in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and it's going to be filled with a bunch of Gentiles who don't know anything about anything, but they know this one thing (laughs) that God loves to be hosted and they're going to go after his presence and God is going to be glorified in this random city in Michigan because this is what God is doing in the earth today. It's global. Why a tent? It's evangel. You can put these on the screen too. Go on. Uh, why a tent? It's evangelistic. It becomes a place where God's spirit can rest. And Pastor Lee had this picture I want to show on the, on the screen, this prophetic picture of, of these tent posts. And he, he saw a picture of a thousand praying churches across America. And as individual churches begin to meet as a house of prayer, Suddenly, we're rebuilding 
this tabernacle that has fallen, worship and prayer, and raising a tent to cover our entire nation under the presence of God. And you know what I see? That breaks down a little bit closer, right? Kalamazoo. I know this is a picture of America. You can leave that slide up there, though. If we have a thousand praying churches in America, what if we had a thousand praying families? And each family is like, each individual is like a little tent peg being buried into the ground of the soil of what God is doing in his house. And as they're planted into the soil, there's a tent raised for God's presence to be hosted. And what if there was a thousand homes in Kalamazoo where places where God's presence could rest, that the lost knew if we just go to Susie's house or Billy's house, we know those people will pray for us. We know there'll be healing and deliverance. We know there'll be the power of God because God rests in this place. This is what God is doing in the earth. Every home, an altar, every church, a house of prayer. And what I feel this morning, we're gonna take some time and do some ministry. I, I felt so strong in the 9 a.m. and I feel even stronger now. There is a attack and assignment of the enemy of shame. And it's interesting because some of you might've seen two weeks ago, one of the things the protesters downtown spray painted across the city center when they were angry after the overturning of Roe v. Wade was the word shame. And I felt like that was this picture of what the demonic is trying to spray paint over the house of God, the word shame. You're not good enough. Oh, that's great for you, Pastor Caleb. You're a preacher holy man, but you don't know the mistakes I've been through. You don't know how broken my family is. You don't know the generational curses. You don't know A, B, C, D. That's the enemy spray painting shame over your heart this morning in red paint trying to stop what God has assigned you to do. Listen, you know who this all started through? King David. King David was a terrible father, probably a worse husband. <laughs> he killed somebody. He committed adultery. I, I dare you to, I mean, maybe some of you are like, oh yeah, well, here's my list. And I'm like, wow, okay, maybe you did beat David. That's amazing. David is this man who got so many things wrong, but he got one thing right and he changed history he said I'm not perfect I don't have it's not that I haven't made any mistakes my home isn't clean I, I, I'm a giant mess but God I just want you I just want your presence I love you and I want to make a place for you to rest and dwell I want but I want to invite you to stand here in Richland and at Portage and I felt this morning specifically that the Lord is stirring hearts and that even as I was preaching, you felt shame telling you why your house couldn't be part of this movement, why you're not gonna rebuild the tabernacle of David because A, B, C, and D, there is a demonic attack of shame that is coming against the people of God that I believe the Lord wants to lift. And so I actually invited the, the worship team to come back up and we're gonna take a few moments. I'm gonna pray. And I just believe the Holy Spirit's gonna highlight some things. And I just encourage you yourself to just search your own heart. If there are any areas of shame in your heart, to, to, to just release that to the Lord. And what I felt what the Lord wanted to do this morning here in Portage and online was he just wanted us to walk out of those doors knowing that we are a priest that blesses his heart. When he looks at us, he doesn't feel disappointment and anger and sadness like we think he does. But he's like, no, don't you understand? You're a priest. My heart is so moved in delight. And, and I know what, you know what? You, once a week, you wrestle your family together in the living room and half of them are fighting and paying attention and, it's, and you sing one song and it feels horrible, but you did it and God's like, I loved it. Oh, I love that time. You're like, what? It was a mess. And God's like, I know I'm in the mess. I just wanna be invited into the mess, into the real life. I want to be invited in. Don't let shame steal this rebuilding of what God is doing. So Lord, even as we, we wait on you for a moment, 
And as the worship team sings, Lord, I ask that you would raise up your house of prayer, Lord, your Levites. Lord, right now that you would strengthen the heart. I ask specifically for mothers and fathers that feel afraid and shameful to pray and worship in front of their kids because of the past. God, I ask for your blood to come and wash over the guilt and the shame in the name of Jesus. covered by the blood our past is covered by the blood and oh my son and oh my daughter you are enough you have what it takes and oh this cry from the Lord. Let's respond and say, I'll make my home an altar. to pray over married couples who feel difficulty. I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but you feel the challenge of praying together with your spouse, and you have shame of the area that you want to pray together, but you feel this wall that's like you can't break through it. And Lord, I just ask right now that you would break down every attack of the enemy to thwart prayer in marriage, God. Husbands and wives praying together, standing together, Lord, we ask what God has joined together. Let no spirit of shame separate. Lord, let no condemnation separate. Let no heaviness separate. Lord, whatever walls are standing in the way, Lord, I ask that you would knock them down. Oh God, I ask for a bedrock of praying marriages, Lord, at Radiant Church, Lord. I ask for husbands and wives and families that pray and worship together in the name of Jesus. We ask, whether we're in family or not, Lord, whether we're single, we live on our own, we live with roommates, we're kids, we're married, we're divorced, Lord, wherever we are at, Lord, we consecrate ourselves. Say, God, we want our homes to be part of this thousand praying families reality in Kalamazoo. God, would you make our home a house of prayer? Would you make our home an altar where your presence can dwell and rest? 
Would you make our, 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 our prayer and our worship, Lord, ascend before heaven, God. We just, we, we're like David and we, we just want you. That's all we know. But God, we know you won't be handled, restrained, or controlled, but you will be hosted by people who want you. Jesus, we say right now from this house, we want you. Jesus, we want you. God, we want you. You've been rejected so many times, and we've failed so many times, but we say from this house, God, we want you. together. From this be that part is online too. Let's sing out. Sing it again from this house. partners, I want to invite you guys to come forward. We just, we had a few powerful prayer moments this morning, particularly on that area of shame where the Lord was just doing something, lifting that weight. And uh, if you have any prayer need, we would love to pray with you. But I, if you feel that, like even while I was preaching, you were like, there was something in in you that was like, you don't deserve this. You can't do this. You're, you're not good enough for this. Whatever that is, that's the lie of shame. And it's from the pit of hell. It is not from the Father and the heart of the Father. And so if that's, if that's you and you still feel that, come forward. And for everyone else, I hope when you walk out those doors, you feel the delight of the Father. You are walking out with an ephod. You wear the priestly garments. The Lord is delighted in your sacrifice. He is with you. He was for you. And I really believe this. We are going to see God do what he promised. And that passage of scripture 2,000 years ago, I believe is going to be fulfilled in our day.